ever wondered what is the testimony of the Stanton First Church of God? Have you ever wondered what people really think about the Stanton First Church of God? Well, I want us to look in the book of Colossians, chapter number 1, where Paul, writing to the church at Colossae, talks about their testimony. Let's begin reading in the first verse. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Jesus, Christ Jesus, and your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Growing up, did your parents um, ever talk to you about your reputation? Yeah, uh, you know, parents, whether they're Christians or not, are going to talk to their children about their reputation. Even if you want nothing to do with God and nothing to do with church, you still want to have a good reputation. And so I thought to myself, uh, I, rem I remember as a kid, my mother frequently telling me, um, be careful, be careful what you say and what you do. Because that leaves you with a reputation or a testimony as to who you really are and how you really act. But here the church at Colossae had a reputation that had made it back to Paul. In verse number 4 he says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints... So this testimony, this reputation had made it back to, the, to Paul. And so in this opening section of his letter to the church, he says to them that I thank you for that testimony and I am praying for you. When you think about testimony and reputation, it's always something that we want to have a good testimony and a good reputation. I have been involved with hundreds of funerals, as many of you know, and I have often wondered what would I want to be said when I am laying in a casket and some, hopefully somebody, is willing to preach my funeral. What would I want them to say? And I believe I would want them to say that he was a man of character. And maybe a step further, he was a man of Christian character. He had a good reputation. He was faithful. He, he was honest. I think that's what I would want folks to say. In Proverbs 22, in verse number 1, the Bible says, A good name is to be chosen rather than silver and gold. Loving favor rather than silver and gold. So you see, our church has a our church has a reputation. Our church has a testimony. And it is up to us as the body of believers that make up the church. It is up to us to decide what the testimony or what the reputation of the church will be. It's totally up to us. There are other Churches in the Bible who, who had reputations. You see, the church at Jerusalem had a testimony of being bold and courageous. The church at Antioch had a testimony of being Christ-like. And those are some good examples. But can I tell you, there are also some bad examples in Scripture 
as to the reputation of churches. The church of Corinth had a testimony of being wicked and having major discord amongst the body of believers. The church of Laodicea had a testimony of being fence straddlers, neither hot nor cold. Did you know that the church, that people in our community are judging this church right now? They are looking at the Stanton First Church of God and they are making a judgment as to who we are and what we are. And I know that we seem to think that since we are a body of believers that lift the name of Jesus high, that we automatically would assume that those beyond the walls of this church automatically think and believe that we are just such great people and such perfect followers of Jesus Christ. But I am here to tell you that that's not what they think of us. Because the church is made up of people. The church is made up of people. And if you know anything about people, we will probably fail one time or another. So I got to thinking about what is a great testimony or what is a good testimony for our church to have? When people look as they come down East College Avenue and they come by the church, what should be the thing that comes to their mind? Well, I've got a few things for you this morning. Number one, I hope that our testimony and our reputation is that we are a living church. A living church. Lord knows that there are way too many dead churches. Somebody say amen. amen. There are way too many dead churches in this world that we live in. I'm talking about churches that are, that are established and they, they have a presence in the community and they are making a difference. There's not many of those left anymore. In fact, look what, or in Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 1, John the Revelator is writing and he says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things say, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Some of our churches look alive from the outside. They have a pretty building. <laughs> and they, have, they keep the grass mowed. And they keep the church sign up. And they pay the electric bill. But when you walk through the doors of the church, it feels like that you are in the midst of a funeral home. Many of our churches are like that. You might say, well, what are some marks of a living church? Well, first of all, a mark of a living church is a praying church. We must understand that this is the strength and the power of the church is prayer. As Paul told the church at Thessalonica, he said, pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. It is the inner fiber of the church. It is the heartbeat of the church. And when we ever get to a place where we think we can make it on our own and that we don't need to pray and ask for the leading of the Spirit, I believe at that point God then puts what he put in Scripture and it says Ichabod above the door, which means the presence of the Lord has left. When we don't make it about prayer and about the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you today so that you know this. That I take prayer very seriously. And that I don't move. The board does not move. This church does not move. Unless it is under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Because a living church is one that is a praying church. Number two, I thought... What are some marks of a living church? Number two, a bold church. You see, it's one thing just to um, come to church and sit down as a group of believers and sing a few hymns and hear a nice message about how great and wonderful God is and leave. That's pretty easy to do, is it not? That's pretty easy to do. But when I talk about a bold church, I'm talking about a church that is willing to be courageous and bold and go to the edge of the limit and not be afraid to go where God is. 
But so many times when we talk about being a bold church, we often think about being bold and taking a stand. Do we not? Are we bold enough to take a stand against something that's contrary to Scripture? And while I believe that that is very true, that we should take a stand against what, is not, what does not line up for Scripture, I want to just say this. Have we ever taken a stand for something? Have you ever noticed that every time we get media coverage to the church, what is it typically about? What we are against. Are we for anything? Are we for anything? We're always against something. Let me ask you a question. Are we for running out social injustice? Are are we for feeding the poor? Are we really for reaching out beyond the four walls of the church? Oh, there's some things we're against, you know. We're really against sin. And we, boy, that's what we really like to harp on and preach about. We love to harp on sin and how awful it is and we're against it. But what are you for? Because can I tell you, I want to challenge you spiritually this morning. Listen, it'll be harder for you to establish what you are for rather than what you are against. It's much harder to to figure out what you're for rather than what you are against. Now, the next thing, what is another characteristic or what is a testimony about Uh, that we want our church to have, number two, a lively church. Now, I want you to understand that there is a difference between living and lively. Big difference. We are a living church as far as we are established and you all are breathing, or at at least I hope you are. And so we are living and and we are established as a um, 501 church. C3. So we are a group that is established and that is moving and that is living. But the question I have is, are we a lively church for Pete's sake? I was talking about being in some churches that mimic a funeral home. Now, I'm not kidding. Now, some of you think I'm joking. I'm not joking. I spent seven and a half years traveling all across this country singing in Hundreds and hundreds of different churches. And I have been in some churches where the piano player, the choir, and the music director should be shot. I mean, it's just bad. I mean, you walk in, and it just sounds like we're marching off to the death camp or something. So when I talk about lively, I'm talking about a a feeling that comes, not just a feeling, but an inhabitation of the spirit that comes upon you that compels you to worship the Lord. As the Bible says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Now, what we don't know is that in the Greek, when it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, it doesn't mean you just are supposed to get up and say something. In the Greek, it literally means to get up and shout that you are redeemed. Our Pentecostal friends, sometimes we like to harp on them. And I would say that sometimes a lot of the things that they do are based on emotion. But at least they're excited about something. Amen? A lively church. A church that praises the Lord. A church that's not afraid to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ and lift his name high. I got thinking, you ever see these guys going down the road? And they're blasting their music. You know what I'm talking about? Now, where we came from up in Ohio, uh, these were mainly African-American gentlemen up in Middletown. And they come bebopping down the road. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, down here, you all do the same thing. Except they're in a big old truck with wheels that are about this big around. Right? And they're blasting Travis Tritt or whatever they're listening to. You all know what I'm talking about. And they're just getting with it. Well, as you know, I'm, I'm a big, big Southern Gospel fan. And so one time, 
One time I was on my way from the house to the bus, getting ready to head out to travel for a weekend, and I pulled up next to one of them boys, you know, that was bebopping. And I was listening to Gold City, Brandon. Um, when he calls, I'll fly away. That was the song I was listening to. <laughs> and so I pulled up next to this guy. <laughs> and he's just... Mm, so, so I rolled down all four windows and cranked that gospel music up. And I was just praising the Lord. Lively. The inhabitation of the Spirit will make you lively. Not an emotion, but the inhabitation of the Spirit. A living church, a lively church. Number three, let's look at what do we want to be known for? What do we want our testimony to be or our reputation? Number three, a loyal church. A loyal church. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2. This is Paul writing to Timothy, his young protege, so to speak, his young disciple. Paul writes to him, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Now we seem to think that that was just for Timothy. But can I tell you as children of God, we are commanded to all, each and every one of us, not just me, not just the pastor or the preacher or the Sunday school teacher, but each and every one of us are commanded to preach the word. Preach the word. So are we loyal to preaching and proclaiming the Word of God? Are we loyal to the Word of God? Because can I tell you, it's one thing to preach the Word. It's a whole other thing to live the Word. We got this preaching thing down real well. But I'll be honest with you, church, we don't have the living thing down very good. Are we loyal to the Word of God? Are we loyal to study the Word of God? To let it soak into our hearts and into our souls and allow it to change us. I thought about the story of Nicodemus. When Jesus came to him, what did Jesus say? Or when he came to Jesus and what was Jesus' reply of the question that he had? You must be born again. And see, we typically think that it just stops there, that, that after we're saved, that that's, that's pretty much it. You know, we've been born again, and that's as good as it's going to get. But can I tell you that we must be born again and again and again and again and again. And how is that done? That is through being loyal to the Word of God. Amen. And then at some point in your life, God will bring you to a place of what is called in Scripture sanctification. When you are loyal to his word. Speaking or thinking about being loyal. Second thing I'd like to look at is being loyal to being in God's house. Now I know, I know, I know we get nervous when the preacher starts talking about Church attendance. Oh, we don't like it. Mm. But I think it's time that we have an honest conversation. Amen. Because remember, we are a testimony. We are an example. We, we have a reputation. And can I tell you what's baffled me as your pastor? As I look back through your attendance records... For the, at least the last 12 to 15 years, you know what I found? One week it's 130, next week 75. And I'm like, what? So I thought I was maybe mistaken, and so I just kept researching and looking, and sure enough, it's like literally about every other week the attendance will go way up and then it drops way down. Let me ask you a question. This is going to hurt, but. We might as well be honest, right? If you treated your job, 
and its attendance, like you treat church attendance, would you still have a job? I know we don't like to think about that. We don't like to talk about it. But it's time we do because we are setting an example. We are setting a reputation, a testimony for the church. And how are you going to tell some lost sinner that is down in the, in the ditch of life that they need to be in church and you can't seem to come at least one time a week? Boy, it's quiet. Amen. That's okay. I hope you're thinking. Now, don't get me wrong. I know we get busy and I know life happens. Okay, I know we have vacations. I know we have crazy work schedules and I understand that. Okay, I'm not, tr I'm not trying to, to browbeat you today, but I just want to get you thinking is, are you really loyal to God's house? Are you really loyal to God's house? I want to look at being a liberal church. Now, some of you, I just said that, and some of you were like, what in the world? Some of you said, we need to fire him. He's wanting to go liberal. Let me clarify. Let me clarify with you. I'm not talking about being liberal in doctrine or being liberal in the stand that we take that's based upon this book. Just a little side note. I just want you, I just want you to know this, that everything that we preach and that we teach is 100% backed up by this book. Okay? So I'm not talking about being liberal as in how we interpret Scripture and do we really believe that this is the inerrant, infallible Word of God because we do believe that this is the inerrant, infallible Word of God and that it is profitable for correction, rebuke. Okay, So we believe that. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being liberal in what we give. I want to be known as a giving church. Something we're going to do next week, and I have not really shared this with anybody. But there is a church in Taze Valley, West Virginia, that has just exploded at the seams. And Dr. Melissa Pratt is their pastor. And they are getting to walk into a $25 million building, $25 million building project. So because I believe that we should be a giving church, you know what we're going to do next Sunday? We're going to take up an offering and send it to them. You're probably thinking, well, we can't even make our own payment. Well, that might be true, but God said to give. He said, don't worry about it, just give it. And so we're going to give. We're going to bless them. And I want you to know that we do a very good job in this department. Of course, uh, we give to the local food pantry. We support them. We su um, I think our ladies uh, sponsor a child uh, through Children of Promise. Um, we also support uh, the New Beginnings Crisis Pregnancy Center, and you all have done that through those baby bottles, and we support them, and, and there's other areas of the ministerial association, we support them as they reach out to the down and out of our society, so we do give, and, and the greatest thing of all is that we give to our general offices to missions so that they can send missionaries all over the world, so we do a pretty good job of giving, but I'm talking about liberal giving, I'm not talking about going in debt and blowing our money. But I'm talking about giving. When God says give, we give. But we must apply the same principle in our own lives. A good preacher friend of mine, uh, James Childers, and he was here uh, the, the Sunday of Pastor's Fellowship. Him and his wife came and surprised us. and so They're such sweet people. He bought this new fancy trailer. It's really cool. It's like red and like dark wood. I mean, it's cool. And he hauls his um, like Polaris thing, that, that golf, whatever it is, fast golf cart or whatever. I don't know what to call it. But he hauls that on that trailer. And he was headed out to Warsaw Kent meeting up there in Ohio. And he put a picture of it on Facebook. And uh, somebody commented on it and said, yeah, my husband would like one of those, but we're just not quite willing to spend the money. And I thought that this was great especially when thinking about giving to the church. He said, well, you can't take it with you. You might as well spend it now. I thought, wow. Amen. And I want to let you know that there are ways that you can continue to give to this church even after you have passed. We have a program here for legacy giving that you can give 
on a continual basis, even after you're gone, that your estate can continue to give to this church. But not only are we to, to give as a church liberally, but give personally. And that's when, it, when, the, when the preacher starts talking about church attendance and he starts talking about your wallet, we get nervous. Well, I've already made you bad, mad talking about church attendance, so I might as well just make you even more mad talking about your wallet. To me, this is a non-negotiable matter. Because the reality is, if you have a problem with it, you're not being obedient and you're not giving. That's the bottom line. So if you come after church and you're going to browbeat me and tell me, show me in the word, I'll show you in the word, and then I'll tell you, be obedient and give God what is his, period. Period. Thank you. Amen. It is not a choice. It is a command. Lastly, moving quickly. Not only to be a liberal church, but lastly, we are to be a loving. What do I want our testimony to be? That we are a loving church. A loving church. You know, we're pretty good about when it comes to loving each other. In fact, the, the church that we read about in Colossians chapter number 1, that's what Paul was, he was talked about their faithfulness, that he had heard the testimony of their faithfulness, and he also had heard about their love for one another. What a good testimony to have. And we should love one another. And I want to tell you today that if you have any, any unforgiveness with one of your brothers in the body of Christ... You need to get it taken care of today. Today. Because Jesus said that if you, if you can't forgive one another who you can see, then how can the Father in heaven forgive you? So that is another must. That's another non-negotiable. Negotiable. Okay? And we do a pretty good job here of loving each other. Oh, we have dinners. Don't we? We like to have dinners. By the way, I'm trying to lose weight. So could we just back off the dinners a little bit, okay? <laughs> anyway, uh, but we have dinners and we have meetings and sometimes we have retreats and we're pretty good loving on each other and caring for one another. But when it comes to the lost, do we really love the lost? Because we have this, we have this opinion of the lost in our mind of this person that comes in the door of our church and they're dressed in a three-piece suit and they come and sit in the church, they do all the right things, they sing the songs correctly, they give prayer requests, but that they still need Jesus. And we say, oh, well, that's the lost and I'm going to love them and pray for them. But what about the lost that stinks? What about the lost that come in in a stained T-shirt ripped in holes in their jeans? What about the loss that can't give to the church? What about the heroin addict that comes in off the street that's high as a kite? Those are the ones that are hard to love. So we have our own version of what, we, of what type of sinner we love. Because you see, when it comes to sinners, we are really good. What's the old saying? Love the sinner, hate the sin. Can I submit to you... I love this quote by Mark Lowry. Love the sinner and hate your own sin. Or better yet, love the sinner and let God take care of the sin. He doesn't need you to take care of somebody else's sin. Now there might be a point in your life when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and God calls you for a specific moment to maybe call out a sin in someone's life. But those minutes or those times are very few and far between. It's not, a, it's not a daily occurrence. Okay? But are we a loving? Is, is the testimony of this church a loving church? No matter what, are we loving? Next week, I'm going to s preach a message of vision for our church. I'm going to preach a series over the next four weeks entitled Reclaiming What Hell Has Stolen. Because that's what we're here for. 
Yes, we're here to, for the beautiful building. And yes, we're here to minister to one another. But we are here to help people reclaim what hell has stolen. And as many of you know, in your own families, hell has stolen a lot. We're going to reclaim our peace. We're going to reclaim our children. We're going to reclaim biblical sexuality. And if you haven't been mad yet, you're mad now because I said the word sex. But it's time we start talking about sex in the church because for far too long the culture has told our children what is pure sexuality. And it's about time we start talking about it. So we're going to go down through many different subjects reclaiming what hell has stolen. And I want that to be our reputation. I want that to be our testimony is that we are the church that are helping people reclaim what hell has stolen. Stand with me.